I want to continue to move along. Uh, the hardest job of today goes to Kurt Forster, who has to deliver his assessment, uh, discussing Rudolph's standing in architectural history and his legacy today. Kurt Forster is a visiting professor at the Yale School of Architecture who has taught in the US and Europe. He's taught at Stanford, MIT, Yete A in Zurich, the Bauhaus University in Weimar. He founded and directed research institutes at the Getty Research Institute in LA and the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. Organized exhibitions on Schinkel in Chicago in 94, Scarpa in Vicenza and Verona in 2000, and Herzog and Demeron in Montreal in 2002, along with the Venice Biennale in 2004. He's published widely on the history of art and architecture, Ponte Moro, 1966, Palladio, 1980, Warburg, 1999, 2002, 2018, and Gary in 1999, interpreting the work of Rossi, Eisenman, Gary, and others. Forster is an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, Academico Luca, member of the Research Councils of the Palladio Center in Vicenza and the Bauhaus de So, and a recipient of the Merritt Oppenheim Prize and an architecture award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. His book, Schinkel, A Meander Through His Life and Work from Burkhauser has just been published. He got to know Paul Rudolph when he was a junior instructor at Yale in the 1960s. Please let us all welcome Kurt Forster. No pictures because you've already seen the things that are to be seen and that are new and that make this gathering, I think, a landmark in uh, the study of uh, Paul Rudolph. I'm very, very grateful to the foundation, to its members, its operatives, its uh, various uh, um, individuals uh, who today, I think, made a fundamental difference for all there is to be known about Paul Rudolph because on the one hand, we're getting to get a first sense of what this archive holds. And it's quite clearly that this is a iceberg uh, of which only a tiny tip, I think, has so far surfaced. Uh, and we have heard from um, uh, a man who is particularly qualified to speak about the career of uh, uh, Paul Rudolph, uh, Bob Stern, uh, who, with his uh, extraordinarily rich and uh, provocative account of the professional biography of Paul Rudolph, reminded us that, uh, obviously, this, tip, this iceberg swims surrounded by schools of emotional fish and of many other creatures that are not normally seen above the water level, right? So, in fact, if I had to think of two things um, that uh, most distinctly will change our understanding of Rudolf, then it is um, those drawings where, with color pencil, he drew in, you don't quite know what, the convection of dust on the inside of rooms, um, perhaps the way the air convections will change the atmosphere of the inside. At any rate, the atmosphere. And that seems, along with the color, and even the choice of a color pencil, in order to convey something of the fact that these buildings, which in the eyes of so many people seem cold and massive and distant, are actually furnaces within which all sorts of amazing uh, emotional dimensions of our life um, seem uh, trapped or encaged. So between these two, I think this day will go down as a, a truly a centennial marker and something which will change what comes thereafter. Uh, because what has been a kind of a vanishing act needs, of course, not only fresh information, fresh eyes, and unconventional thinking to be turned around. It's the unmistakable character, of course, of Paul's buildings that made them easy targets for critical rejection and blame for systemic neglect and even demolition, but as we have heard, also intelligent, imaginative, and even provocative, um, well, what should one call it? A remaking, refashioning of uh, what itself had been perhaps almost facetiously left to a short lifespan. Um, I'm so delighted to see that nobody talked about brutalism because <laughs> Uh, this label, brutalist, uh, 
uh, is, 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 is terrible. It is, uh, it is next to the evil empire, it's probably the worst that can be put as a spell on any architect. Um, and once an individual and a body of work has been pigeonholed in this fashion, it is difficult to free them of preconceived ideas and to recognize the true qualities of the work. Historians, in fact, are often guilty of this kind of laziness, even of scapegoating. And critics in Rudolf's time, as we caught a glimpse or two to remind us of those uh, effects, uh, are doubly guilty of this. Why should anyone care today that Nicholas Pefsner and Rainer Bannon were ticked off by Rudolf's work when what they championed instead was of a distinctly narrower gauge, as we would all have come to understand by now. So the flat-footed concept of brutalism has stuck in most countries, I hate to say, um, to a body of work that is as rich in delicate and elegant qualities, in intricate and sophisticated uh, thought as it is decried for the Baroque realm of its material. So go tell that to Bernini. Be sure <laughs> Rudolf is not alone in suffering such summary characterization. I only mentioned that one of the most imaginative architects in Italy of the turn of the century around 1900, Giuseppe Sommaruga, is never never ever mentioned without a, a subordinate clause calling him an Italian architect of the Art Nouveau or Liberty movement, as if that had been his task in life to hold up the placard convenient for historians to recognize what party he may have been um, associated with. So I'm, I'm so glad that, this, that we've overcome um, this sort of tough Brit grit um, uh, designation of something which has so many other qualities which the Brits usually have to travel to Italy to re-encounter. It is a rare architect whose work lends itself to this emblematic role, uh, re represent to be representative of a particular time. To a certain extent, this is possible with Paul Rudolph. It may be the obverse of the singular blame attributed to a person uh, when one looks back at the Kennedy years. I mean, it's quite uncanny to what extent there is there a sort of consonance um, uh, between, uh, be between the times, as it were, and uh, the architect. And of course, this gives rise to completely unjust um, abbreviations, naturally, and uh, to uh, qualifications which may be very dubious in themselves. But it does seem that at that moment there were two figures uh, who perhaps even just by the, the quantity of work um, reproduced, uh, discussed, uh, um, and, and entertained by, by students, by professionals, by the public at large, that are two names at that moment that somehow belong together. That's, of course, Lou Kahn and Paul Rudolph. Kahn, almost a generation older and an immigrant, was able to bring a slow career to a late bloom, beginning with the Yale Architecture Art Gallery and ending with the National Assembly Building of Bangladesh um, less than 20 years later. So here, too, it's interesting to see the time span that this work um, displays. Yale played a com comparable role in the career of Rudolf, who emerged from the rural south with an obligatory Harvard vetting before assuming the chairmanship of architecture at Yale. In the late 1950s, the university was headed by an innovative president who paid attention to his eminence Gris, the architect Eero Saarinen. Griswold hoped to see the college set onto a course for which it was hardly prepared and which didn't really outlast the moment. During which Rudolf designed three highly distinctive buildings for the campus, and several more for the town. While it is perhaps noteworthy that both Kahn and Rudolf came from what can in some way be rightfully characterized as the fringes of architectural culture in the United States, it is truly astonishing how their professional careers diverged completely after the brief period when they were both associated with Yale. I'm sure secretly Bob is very 
um, um, happy about this in, in and of itself because it does undoubtedly uh, demonstrate a strength of which he himself part in his formative years and to which he has added so much, I might say. I'm not usually given to nostalgia, but I must say he has added a very great deal uh, to the second spell. By the mid-1960s, books and journals, of course, on American architecture were replete with Kahn's and Rudolf's work. And after Kant's death in 1974, he began to be celebrated as a lone star wandering across the firmament where Mies and Le Corbusier shone, while Rudolf seemed to have lost his way and sank below the horizon like an orange moon somewhere in the Far East. By the time of his passing in 1997, he was the subject of maudlin obituaries, as if he had never commanded the stage, but left only a torso of architecture behind. The lesson is both banal and bracing. Of course, sic transit gloria mundi, to be sure, but it's also a rude reminder that the fame in architecture can be even more transitory than on the silver screen. Why? In a word, Rudolf came out of nowhere and passed out of sight almost as quickly, while Kahn had chosen the long and arduous way to lasting achievement with his dutiful work in Philadelphia, his repeated study trips to Europe and the Middle East, finally gaining recognition on other continents as only European architects used to do late in life. He cast his thoughts in sibylline statements, actually not unlike John Cage. And like the composer, well, only John Cage would have asked the key on the piano what it would want to be. Well, <laughs> it would only want to be the key of that, that sound, that pitch, right? Uh, what choice did it have? Poor key, poor uh, brick. Anyway, not unlike the composer, uh, he brought a very much a hands-on attitude to the solution of problems that required rethinking of the ordinary and actually an enormous amount of spontaneous improvisation. There are enough records of how Rudolf continually changed things in the, his various uh, 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 private residences and, and studios, how much of it was actually done by like holding up the painting before you put the nail in to hang it, uh, rather than being the result of a complicated uh, computation that would have declared the nail to be the destiny forever for that particular frame. By contrast, Rudolf paid his dues in the highly regional context and managed to ascend the escalier. One could say if there is one master in the 20th century of stairs, then surely it is Paul Rudolf. And he is so in breathtaking ways, delivering during his short chairmanship at Yale, a stunning series of buildings that would have taxed the capacity of a much more seasoned architect with a far larger office than his. Shortening the distance between the school and his residence cum studio in New Haven to the length of only one block, he gutted a dignified house and ensconced both himself and the small crew of his associates in it. Rudolf dedicated every day, and as we've heard from uh, people more qualified to speak on it, although I have my own personal recollection of the fact of very often part of the night, or perhaps as large a part of the night as you could possibly claim for this sort of work, in pursuit of his ideas, crafting in the process remarkable oeuvre of drawings that still holds interest even for those who are not enamored of his buildings. And for both purposes, he rehearsed, as architects are wont to do, the chief components of his projects, turning the basement into, into, of the apartment uh, that included a low section as a sort of a dining alcove and uh, providing for a very tall living room toward the walled-in courtyard into which one could descend for almost the entire length of those famous concrete treads without a handrail. 
And of course, that's another aspect which is so wonderfully consistent that wherever possible, Rudolf was always courting disaster. And I remember, for, I remember forever um, in that, um, in that uh, guest house on top, that uh, curious perch that one never quite understood for whom it had actually been put there, um, he would stand forward with his two feet, with his two shoes hitting the plate glass. And he would standing there and sort of in the sure um, uh, expression that if he were to fall, he would fly. Um, and uh, that is very much the way he, he re responded to danger, by courting it, embracing it, and in the end, of course, defying it in some way or another almost as often as possible. Now, um, uh, what uh, was so striking in those drawings that uh, uh, Timothy Rowan uh, uh, showed us, for me for the first time, I'd never seen them, uh, but they strike a very strong chord in me because as one studies uh, the destination of the emotional aspects and qualities of anything architectural, from the walls to the atmosphere, um, from the parkour, parkour uh, to the particular coloration and nuance that space can acquire as a result of all of those poorly tested and always fluid conditions from lighting, from color, from tone and material, etc. What is so, so powerful here uh, that since the early 19th century, uh, uh, emotions, feelings have returned to architecture. They had a hard struggle because by the definition of a sort of a more categorical approach, they were to be excluded and they were to be um, held in check rather than to be given free reign. Uh, but w uh, again and again, one has tempted with the introduction of color in the first place in the early 19th century, and then with all of the new materials, textures, uh, and atmospheric qualities and spatial uh, particular characteristics uh, in order to enliven this. That's why that image of him that you've seen where with folded arms he is resting on that piece that most people decried as a, a brutal, dangerous, vicious, etc. in architecture as a kind of a devil in architecture. Um, uh, it, that he comfortably and completely harmlessly is able to support his very person, right? His very presence on that particular bush hammered, uh, um, as it were, demonstration piece, it's as if he put uh, his approving arms and hands on uh, the w one thing that actually the builders had to learn. They had to pour particular sections so they could could learn how to do this because as the finished building shows, not everybody is equally able to be brutal because it takes an enormous amount of sensitivity to accomplish this. Now, the other side of Baroque buildings, namely their dimensions, their bursts of light, their airiness and delicacy, all the more enchanting for the contrast with a wobbly organ point of rustication, right? That's what it's really called. Intrigued Rudolf no less than the stagey display of mass, of vigorous sculptural elements of water in the way in which, for instance, the Fontana di Trevi also made a return in 1960 with Fellini's La Dolce Vita. Rudolf certainly matched Fellini's tactile virtuosity, love of exaggeration, all the while keeping a hand on clock and camera. The unforgettable moments from La Dolce Vita, water and clothing, sounds of dripping, spigots of clanking heels, of feathers beaten out of cushions, and the wobbly mass of a sea monster stranded oh, can be matched by Rudolf's foamed up insulation, orange carpeting, plate glass shearing into rough concrete, and the tracery of recovered metalwork, like from Louis, Lou Sullivan's Chicago buildings. He installed, along with many plaster casts of classical sculpture in the art and architecture building at Yale, as it was then called, and for very good reason, uh, making a connection, however unhappy for those who wanted to cross it from different sides, a connection between art and architecture. If there is no way around 
the decline of Rudolf's reputation. There is, however, a growing recognition of the exceptional quality of his work. And I think what we've heard about how to handle, restore, maintain, or remake the works brings this home in the most immediate fashion and gives one a true appreciation of the enormous, relentless amount of intelligence that, however, is there and applied in order to bring across something else but itself. It is not a dry, excogitated project. It is something which, in the end, will affect you in a very uh, dif distinctive way. And, of course, the ruggedness of his ideas and the captivating nature of his drawings are only two sides of this. Again, the delicate and the, and the raw, uh, the extremely refined uh, and, and, and uh, things which somehow reside more in a shadowy margin of reality. Uh, highly unusual for an architect of his meteoric ascent and this volume of work in the 1960s, he continued to draw a great deal and to fashion in the process a kind of graphic physiognomy for his studio. Uh, naturally, as would be the case with painters and other architects, m apprentices have to learn to imitate the master, and sometimes they come close, and sometimes they do fall sorely short. That does not in and of itself in any way take anything away from the fact that uh, there is a kind of drawing which, again, exhibits clearly these two fundamental dimensions. And in that regard, I think we do well to look back, for instance, at Otto Wagner's drawing. Otto Wagner did this fabulous um, uh, perspectival cut into the Postal Savings Bank building and uh, at the same time filled in inside and out every technical detail down to every um, rivet that was employed to hold up its various materials lining the structure. A, a, a metal structure. Uh, using chiefly Indian ink and vellum, but also, of course, as we've seen, um, uh, charcoal, um, the drawings often match partial sections with perspectival depth, laying in gossamer curtains and accentuating solids with calligraphic virtuosity. It would be no exaggeration to say that he was um, even more than Kahn, the author of a style of architectural drawing capable of conveying precisely what he aimed for. Spatial complexity, differentiation among all functional elements, where stairs again claim a cardinal role, and a sense of experiencing the building as if one inhabited a kind of carcass, what remained of a formerly life body. Once more, the Art and Architecture Building at Yale affirms its preeminent place, not only in the inaugural structure in a long series of buildings for municipalities, colleges, churches, um, private houses, though on a lesser scale, but also as a fully accomplished opus. Now, the astonishing thing that these meteoric circumstances and limitations that mark his biography would not in and of themselves have made us expect that he was able to carry, in fact, a vast body of work uh, uh, to completion and to continually construct ways of linking what he had done across wide differences, not even infelicitous changes. And the, the recent addition in some cases of mediocre buildings have seriously damaged the mutually enhancing contrast of strength and delicacy. The pinwheel layout and internal well with surrounding galleries resonates for the A&A &A building with Wright's long demolished Larkin building. So it's interesting that perhaps the one building that initially may have given the strongest impetus was already a ghost at that time. So um, uh, Rudolf is himself in the business of, um, of, of this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, mirror uh, exercise that he is bringing back out of semi-oblivion something which would otherwise have claimed a particular uh, powerful sh shadow boxing um, quality in the culture. 
Um, whoever grows familiar with the structure, and I'm happy to say that I have spent years in it for ver in various capacities over half a century, and they always love to run up and down the stairs. If there's so many, you don't get in trapped into one elevator or one shaft. You can go in and around this building in any way you wish. We'll they will come to love the variety among identical elements. Um, the unexpected corners, the characteristic volumes, the deep wells of space, and the surprising cross connections, the dramatic transitions from umbers to bright areas. Some of the massive complexes Rudolf was commissioned to design quickly and effectively for commercial purposes, administration buildings, as those in Boston, or the latter the later office structures in Fort Worth and Hong Kong, they suffer by comparison as the architect's capacity to imagine them. What makes the body of a building is bound at times to falter for a moment, perhaps for the sheer size and uh, uh, for the extraordinary complexity of some buildings. I think of Boston. Uh, where you will be dismayed to find that uh, the building is uh, like the Colosseum in the Middle Ages, occupied by everybody else except for by those who were originally intended, of course, to occupy. There are no Christians being sacrificed to the lions, but, uh, uh, but there are a lot of other sacrificial uh, activities going on there. Wherever he was able to take time to define the parts with Indian ink and to imagine the whole in the changing light of day and season, including plants, sidewalks, rooftops, and views, he pulled off much more than could be expected. With his generosity of imagination and the deeply empathetic capacity to anticipate every atmospheric condition, both those external and those of his own devising, Rudolf invested his rich sensibility in the hard, unwieldy, and strange materials that customarily turn buildings into alienating machines, often with no garden to mitigate their mechanical claptrap. His art and architecture building has remained a unique landmark on the Yale campus and a rare achievement in American post-war architecture. It is, I would say, quite simply, his masterpiece. Thank you.